Hello, and welcome to the third and final webinar in our Health and Safety series. In the first webinar, I discussed current issues and thinking around legal privilege, following on from a recent Court of Appeal judgment. The second webinar was a discussion around important issues to be considered and planned for in advance of when a regulatory inspector comes calling. For those who are interested and may have missed those two webinars, they are both still available to view online. Today, uh, we have a short legal update and which will consider some of the recent developments in the health and safety sphere, together with a look at a selection of recent court decisions which will illustrate the potential consequences to companies and their directors should things go wrong. For those joining the series for the first time, and by way of very brief introduction, my name is Kevin Clancy and I'm a senior associate within the Commercial Disputes and Regulation Division. I've also spent a short period on secondment at Crown Office within the Health and Safety Division, and so have experience of liaising with inspectors from the Health and Safety Executive. In terms of the aim for this webinar, I hope you'll come away with a better understanding of relevant changes to health and safety law over the past 12 months, and perhaps more interestingly, how the courts are currently approaching breaches of health and safety legislation. That is partic particularly so now that the sentencing guideline for England and Wales has become well established and part of the fabric of health and safety proceedings. Whilst impossible to cover every possible issue or the vast array of court judgments in a 30-minute webinar, hopefully the topics that have been selected will be diverse and interesting. As a final introductory point, uh, please be aware uh, to aid the sound quality you've all been placed on mute, uh, so please try to avoid uh, inad inadvertently unmuting yourself. So in terms of health and safety over the past 12 months, where are we now? There are a couple of takeaway points from this slide which portrays a generally positive outlook, reflective of an improving culture of safety and a mature system of regulation. The statistics in the slide relate to the period 2017-2018 and have only recently been published by the Health and Safety Executive. In relation to prosecutions, the 493 successful prosecutions is a decrease on the 554 of the previous year, which itself was a decrease from 660 the previous year again. Fines, however, continue to rise, increasing to £73 million from £70 million last year, but which had almost doubled from the £38 million the year previous to that. Although the fines appear to be slightly levelling off, this follows a significant increase following the introduction of the sentencing guideline. Also interesting is that the rate of non-fatal injuries to employees reporting under RIDOR also shows a continuing long-term downward trend. Of the 144 recorded fatalities, it is noteworthy for organisations that the highest proportion are the result of falls from height which is an area of concern for HSE, with fatalities due to in individuals being struck by moving vehicles taking second place. Looking at matters on a purely sector basis, agriculture, forestry and fishing industries continue to lead the way in terms of work-related ill health and workplace injury. Looking to the future, one question most people have is the impact Brexit may have on health and safety. The answer to that question truly is one of wait and see. The HSE's Brexit advice thus far is vague and of limited practical use beyond some reasonably detailed statements in relation to chemicals. With today being the start of five days of Brexit debate, it will be interesting to see what impact Britain's future relationship with the EU has on health and safety law and regulation. What is ISO 45001? That could potentially be a 30-minute webinar in itself. However, looking at the new international standard in summary form, ISO 45001 is being held up as the first global standard for occupational health and safety management and was first published earlier this year. It is a replacement for OHSAS 18001. The new standard's objective is to provide robust and effective processes for improving occupational safety and health, regardless of the size of the organisation and with an expectation that it should reduce workplace injuries and illnesses. 
The aim is to help organisations reduce health and safety burdens by providing a framework to improve employee safety, reduce workplace risks and create better, safer working conditions. The approach is risk-based. Organisations should approach health and safety on a plan, do, check and act basis. And so the focus is one that minimises the risk of harm in the workplace. Uh, we have already seen earlier in the webinar the number of injuries that can occur in the UK on an annual basis and which can be at considerable cost to employers. A significant point of emphasis is the need to demonstrate top-level management involvement that integrates health and safety issues across the organisation. Occupational safety and health should not be viewed as a stand-alone matter. Through integration and preventative measures, the aim is to reduce the worst workplace injury statistics that I have already touched upon. It is perhaps some comfort that ISO 45001 is designed to be aligned with other ISO management system standards, which will allow for compatibility and reduce the likelihood of duplication. It will require improvements and adjustments to be made if an organisation holds the previous standard, but there is a three-year grace period. Recent decisions of the courts in relation to legal privilege may be one of the most significant legal developments in 2018. That is especially so given the Court of Appeals decision in the case of serious fraud office against Eurasian Natural Resources Corporation. I discussed this case in some detail in webinar one, uh, so I don't intend to cover the same ground again. Suffice to say, the ENRC case, or perhaps more accurately, the implications of that case, are worthy of consideration by senior managers, health and safety consultants, solicitors and in-house advisors. Put very briefly, legal professional privilege, properly applied, entitles a client to decline disclosure of certain confidential legal communications to third parties, including the police, the health and safety executive and other regulatory bodies and enforcement agencies. It comprises legal advice privilege which protects advice given by lawyers to their clients, and litigation privilege, which protects communications between a client and a lawyer and third parties if litigation or adversarial proceedings have been commenced or are anticipated. As I discussed in webinar one, the Court of Appeals decision now lends itself to the interpretation that litigation privilege may arise at an early stage of an investigation by inspectors of the HSE when litigation or adversarial proceedings are anticipated. Timely legal advice will be required. Although I won't go into the ENRC case in detail again in this webinar, one case involving a company, Gaskell's NW Limited, is worthy of some comment. The reason this case is of interest is because it neatly brings into sharp focus the possibility of an employee and company being prosecuted, albeit for slightly different reasons, with legal privilege playing some role in the eventual outcome. Dealing firstly uh, with one of the employees, Mr Jukes. Mr Jukes had been the transport and operations manager of Gaskell's. In 2010, an employee was crushed to death when he entered a bailing machine to clear a, blo a blockage. Mr Jukes was alleged to have had responsibility for health and safety and maintenance of the machine at the relevant time and had failed to take reasonable care for the safety of employees. He was convicted of a health and safety offence and sentenced to nine months imprisonment. On appeal against conviction, one of the issues raised by Mr Jukes was the admissibility of a statement which he had made to the company's solicitors as part of their investigation a few weeks after the incident. Mr Jukes's contradictory assertions are set out on the slide. On the one hand, he explained to the solicitors that he did have uh, responsibility for health and safety management but by contrast provided a contradictory uh, statement to HSE in which he denied any responsibility. The solicitor statement had been relied upon by the prosecution at the trial as it undermined and contradicted the prepared statement he had later given to the health and safety executive and to the police. Mr Jukes argued that the solicitor statement was covered by privilege and as such should not have been relied upon by the Crown. The judge disagreed. On appeal, the Court of Appeal reiterated that the document did not enjoy the protection of privilege. Crucially, 
legal advice privilege could not apply, as Mr Dukes was not a client of the company's solicitors. This is an issue that companies should never lose sight of, and it is particularly important to identify at an early stage of an investigation who it is the legal advisers are acting for. As far as litigation privilege was concerned, at the time the statement was made, the HSE were investigating the matter, but had not yet commenced any proceedings. Crucially, there was no evidence which showed that at the time the statement was made, anybody knew what the companies or the HSE's investigations would unearth. As such, it could not be said, on the particular facts of this case, that there was a reasonable prospect of the HSE deciding to prosecute. A claim to litigation privilege would therefore fail. The outcome simply highlights the importance of properly documenting if investigations were undertaken in anticipation of possible criminal proceedings. It also highlights the need for employees to be properly advised ahead of any interview or statement. What then happened in relation to the company? Subsequent events should serve to reinforce the need for companies to not only properly assess the level of risk to employees, but regularly review and update that risk assessment at frequent intervals. Put shortly, the incident that occurred in 2010 and which led to Dukes' imprisonment concerned a machine that compresses paper and cardboard. The door that provided access to the compaction chamber was fitted with an interlocked guard. As with any such device, its purpose was to stop the machine if the door was opened. It was established that this particular guard had been bypassed or defeated. Basically, workers could enter the machine even if the machine was operating. And so it was that an employee of the company was killed after entering the stationary machine, but which subsequently reactivated itself. There was a joint investigation by HSE and the police. It was found that the machine frequently became blocked and required operator intervention. The company was aware of this. The risk assessments were found to be inadequate. Training and supervision was found to be insufficient. Worse still, the company had previously been told that the lock was being bypassed. Prohibition notices were served in the company in January 2011, followed by an improvement notice later that month. One might be forgiven for thinking that given the history of the machine, steps would be taken to ensure that the risk assessments were reviewed and the interlock guard was functioning properly. Five years later, <coughs> an inspector of HSE visited the premises, having been told that the same machine was being operated with further critical safety systems having been defeated. The inspectors found that the machine could again be operated with the guarding open. HSE described such a series of events as being inconceivable. Proceedings were taken against the company and against one of the directors who was said to be the one controlling the company. Although initially a separate offence, it was agreed prior to trial that the 2015 failure would be a serious aggravating factor to the 2010 offence. Guilty pleas were ultimately tendered. Taking into account the sentencing guideline and applying a discount for the early guilty pleas, the final sanctions are as set out on the slide. <clears throat> Certainly one of the most talked about events of 2018, and which would not have failed to clutter your email inbox, relates to the introduction of the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR for short. That is really an area where specialist advice ought to be sought if it has not already been done so before now. But within the wording of the legislation, there is opportunity to fall foul of the law when looked at in a health and safety context. Plainly, obtaining consent each and every time personal data is processed would be unduly burdensome. So, simpler is to make sure that any data retained falls within either of the categories referenced on the slide. GDPR and health and safety might likely coincide with one another in the course of an investigation. However, conducting an investigation within the parameters of health and safety legislation should not result in you falling on the wrong side of the law. However, the distribution of the fruits of that investigation and the potential dissemination of personal data may require far more care to be taken, and some thought will need to be given as to whether parts of a report require a form of redaction. Turning to enforcement, 
when one considers the potential consequences of a visit by an inspector of the HSE. One of the most significant cases of 2018 is a decision of the Supreme Court in an appeal by Her Majesty's Inspector of Health and Safety against Chevron North Sea Limited. The appeal concerned a legal argument around enforcement notices served under the Health and Safety at Work Act, and more importantly, what information can subsequently be considered by the Employment Tribunal when determining any appeal against an improvement or prohibition notice. Chevron, as an operator of an offshore installation in the North Sea, was inspected by HSE inspectors in April 2013. An important part of Chevron's installation is the helideck. Having examined the installation, the inspector concluded that corrosion to the stairways and stagings that provided access to the helideck was such that it had been rendered unsafe and compromised safe evacuation. The consequence was that a prohibition notice required to be served. The service of a prohibition notice on a duty holder has the potential to do quite considerable harm, for example, in the disruption to business, the financial cost, the ability to tender, and reputational damage. The only means by which a prohibition notice that has come into effect may be cancelled, and so prevent an entry being made on HSE's public database, is a successful appeal to the Employment Tribunal. Chevron did indeed appeal in May 2013, and at the hearing of the appeal sought to rely upon an expert report that was finalised in March 2014, after the appeal had commenced and a considerable time after the prohibition notice had been issued. The expert report concluded that the metal work of concern to the inspector did in fact pass the British Standard Strength Test. Or, to put the point another way, there was no risk of individuals falling through the installation and no risk of a safe evacuation being compromised. The inspector argued that the tribunal should not have regard to that new evidence, which came to light 11 months after the inspection, but instead the tribunal should confine its decision-making to evidence and information that was available to the inspector, or ought reasonably to have been available, at the time of the inspection. The tribunal disagreed, considered the expert report, and cancelled the prohibition notice. The inspector appealed that decision to the Court of Appeal in Scotland, but was again unsuccessful. The matter was then taken to the UK Supreme Court. By determining that the correct approach is to consider all of the evidence that may assist in understanding what risk, as a matter of fact, existed, the Supreme Court was clear that this judgment does not undermine any suggestion that inspectors require effective tools to ensure compliance. Indeed, Lady Black observed that this means an inspector might just as well feel less inhibited about serving a prohibition notice, confident that if it turns out that there is in fact no material risk, the position can be corrected on appeal. In light of those comments, it remains to be seen if we might well see greater enforcement activity. And if so, there may be potentially time-consuming investigatory work required in order to successfully challenge a prohibition or improvement notice. Turning to prosecutions, the HSE statistics we looked at earlier tell an interesting story. That is in the context, in terms of HSE's published statistics, where it is the second full year where new sentencing guideline in England and Wales has been in effect. Of greatest interest is the fact that total fines levied have now, have now, riven, excuse me, have now risen to £73 million in one year from just over £38 million around two years ago. Within the past six months, it is reported that over 60 fines have exceeded £100,000, of which 10 amounted to £1 million or more. One of the most newsworthy fines since the introduction of the guideline was the £5 million imposed upon Merlin in relation to the incident involving the roller coaster at Alton Towers. And for those appointed as directors of companies, more sobering is the increasing number of prison sentences for directors. Before uh, concluding the webinar with some illustrative examples of recent prosecutions, it is worth a very quick refresher as to the sentencing guideline that exists in England and Wales. It is also worth remembering that the guideline, whilst not binding in Scotland, has been accepted by the Scottish courts as assisting decision-making. 
the courts are asked, as part of the guideline, to go through the process of looking at culpability. Culpability is graded in four categories, and the court then goes on to consider the seriousness and likelihood of harm, before then turning to the company's financial information, which is again split into categories based on the level of the company's turnover. That analysis allows the court to place the company into a particular category having regard to those factors, before then adjusting the level of fine with reference to aggravating and mitigating factors and the whole circumstances of the particular case. Within each category, the guideline provides for a range of financial penalties available to the court. In general terms, the range suggested for a case involving a fatality is likely to be higher, sometimes significantly higher, than might be expected under the line of previous Scottish case law. What is clear is that the courts are not shying away from handing out custodial sentences to directors whose behaviour has shown a flagrant disregard for the law. The case involving Riaz Ahmed arises out of property work being undertaken on a large Victorian building in Oldham. In converting from office space into a proposed restaurant, Ahmed appointed workers who had no experience of construction or demolition in order to carry out the works at the site. You can almost guess where this is going. The HSE visited the site shortly after receiving a call from the local authority, who in turn had been tipped off by a concerned member of the public. The HSE found almost all of the internal walls and the supports of the internal roof had been removed. The condition of the structure was so dangerous that a, pro a prohibition notice was served and a major road next to the building was closed. More alarming was the fact that some of the workers were moving in and out of the building, notwithstanding this highly dangerous state. The following day, it was established that there was no safe way of entering the building. The intention had been to obtain an order to demolish the existing structure. Unfortunately, within minutes of the inspectors leaving the site, the building partially collapsed, resulting in a major emergency incident. The council arranged for an emergency demol demolition later the same day. The HSE investigation established that Mr Ahmad was found to have employed unskilled workers who had no experience of construction. He had neglected the risks from working at height. He had ignored the stability of the building. He had failed to provide the workers with basic welfare facilities, and he had not considered several health hazards. Upon a guilty verdict, the judge followed the definitive guideline whilst noting that the health and safety system now proceeds on the basis of the guideline rather than pre-existing case law. Culpability was assessed as high, with the overall harm category being Category 1. The offence was aggravated by AMAD cutting costs at the expense of safety. These were wholesale failures and highly dangerous practices. It was nothing short of a miracle that people weren't injured. He was sentenced to eight months' imprisonment, and he was also ordered to pay the £65,000 in prosecution costs. Uh, the case of Yorkshire Water Services should serve as an important reminder that not only should risk assessments be adequately undertaken, but it should be more than just box ticking and form filling. The risk assessments must adequately consider the site-specific risks and hazards that may exist. Generic risk assessments downloaded from a company intranet or elsewhere may not be reliable or sufficient. What works for one organisation may not work for another. A fatal accident occurred at a sewage treatment works in North Yorkshire. The treatment plant consisted of two adjoining lanes, lane 1 and lane 2. Oxygen gas injection was used as part of the clean-up process. Lane 1 had been taken out of service some years earlier although it had been identified that oxygen had been leaking from lane 2 into lane 1 over the years. Two employees were tasked with changing a stop valve within the disused lane 1. It was reported that two employees, using a laptop, downloaded and completed a pro forma risk assessment and method statement. The intention had been to free corroded bolts using hand tools. That was not possible and so power tools were then sourced. However, the use of power tools had not been factored into the risk assessment. 
Working in the confined space of the dry well, sparks from the power tools caused one of the employee's overalls to burst into flames, causing whole body burns, and he tragically died. What can be learned from this? A generic risk assessment was inadequate. It did not identify oxygen as being a hazard, and that was plainly a source of ignition. Nor had the risk assessment been revisited when it became clear the original plan of work could not be carried out. That lane 1 was oxygen enriched um, had been identified some years before, with a near-miss report being logged on the company's system. But there was a lack of site-specific procedures. Notably, neither employee was familiar with the site. The employees therefore had no experience themselves of identifying potential site hazards before attempting the task of filling out the risk assessment. The main takeaway from this case is a salutary reminder of the importance of a site-specific risk assessment when implementing an adequate and effective safe system of work. Applying the guideline, it is also noteworthy that the fine imposed was fairly significant. An emerging trend in health and safety cases has been the imposition on company directors of a period of disqualification, following on from a successful prosecution, with director disqualification being one of the sentencing options open to the judge. The case I have selected here is therefore slightly unusual. Although the disqualification arose from a company's health and safety failures, the period of disqualification was imposed some 18 months after the company was sentenced for health and safety offences and was at the instance of the insolvency service rather than at the hand of the HSE or Crown Office. The director had not previously been charged with a criminal offence. Put very shortly, the insolvency service has a role to investigate potential misconduct by directors of companies that have become insolvent and then pursue enforcement measures if it is in the public interest. Why then did the insolvency service get involved at all? One must go back to July 2014 when an incident occurred involving the director's company, Allen and Hunt Construction Engineers, and which resulted in an employee suffering serious injury after a fall of six metres when working at height. Three months after the incident, a new company, A&H Structures, was incorporated. Upon subsequent investigation, it appears this led to a split in the business. A&H Structures would deal with the fabrication side of the business, whilst Allen and Hunt Construction Engineers would deal with the installation side of the business, but which was ultimately wound down. Allen and Hunt Construction Engineers was prosecuted. The company admitted its failings, and a fine of just under £300,000 was imposed. One month later, in December 2016, that company entered liquidation. Enter the insolvency service, who had a role in investigating the company's insolvency. It is reported that Michael Allen, a director of the company, told the insolvency service that the company had to close because it could not afford to pay the fine. Herein lay a problem for Mr Allen. Upon further investigation, it was the conclusion of the insolvency service that the company would have been in a position to pay the fine if the fabrication contracts had not been earlier transferred to the other company, A&H Structures. The insolvency service therefore sought a disqualification against Mr Allen. He agreed to sign a disqualification undertaking and which avoids the need for court proceedings. They accepted matters of unfit conduct concerned his failure to ensure that the insolvent company complied with its obligations under the Health and Safety at Work Act, with the result that an employee sustained serious injuries. What can be seen from this perhaps somewhat unusual case is that a failure to adhere to health and safety legislation and a failure to pay a fine imposed upon the company, even when the director himself is not criminally prosecuted, can lead to director disqualification. And with that, I will bring this webinar and this health and safety series to a conclusion. The webinar series began with an analysis of developments in legal privilege, whilst webinar two hopefully provided some practical insights around what to do when an investigation at your premises is underway. Hopefully this legal update covering developments over the last 12 months, and which has included a brief refresher in the sentencing guideline and a selection of cases to illustrate the sentencing tools available to the court, has been a useful insight into the direction of travel for health and safety enforcement. And that just leaves me to thank you for attending uh, this afternoon. Thank you.